WebAssembly is targeting compiled languages. It's portable. We're going to model it on the web. We don't want to bake in a particular architecture. And it's secure. It is basically essentially the same security model that JavaScript has. It can't touch your local file system. It can't corrupt your machine. Um, it's stuck within the sandbox of the browser. And it's an open standard being worked on by multiple browser vendors. A couple quick um, overview of WebAssembly. If you haven't uh, seen it familiar with it, it's a pretty normal architecture in many ways. Um, WebAssembly benefits a lot from the convergence of CPU architectures over the decades. So many of the sort of odd details of CPU architectures that tend to bubble up through the ecosystem have basically converged, and, and modern architecture like x 6 and ARM more or less agreed in a lot of these basic details. Um, I do want to call out in particular the IEEE 754 floating point. Um, WebAssembly has, has uh, float and double as, as single and double precision. Um, and the floating point is actually fully deterministic. So if you've, if you've heard of other systems having problems with like x87 routing differently in different cases, uh, WebAssembly does not have that problem. We just define x87 to not be the correct routing mode and the correct routing mode. And we do have tests for this is the IEEE routing modes for single double precision. Um, and DNS is also something that we can talk a lot about, which, which is if they get DNA or little is better. Um, but the advantages of either one of them are definitely outshadowed by the fact that if you have one NDNS across your entire ecosystem, that's way better than having one or the other versus of the NDNSs. So we've picked one, uh, we picked little Indian, and we just said the entire ecosystem is going to be little Indian, which eliminates a lot of problems. Um, we're, we're looking at sort of a 32-bit variant of WebAssembly and a 64-bit variant. Um, technically, there isn't actually a variant. Um, it just within the system, when you talk to memory, you can use 32-bit pointers, you can use 64-bit pointers. Right now, the focus is largely on 32-bit pointers, particularly on the web. Most applications on the web aren't going to use more than 4 gigabytes of RAM. Um, and using smaller pointers means you use less RAM overall anyway. So the status of WebAssembly, uh, we're working on what we call the MVP, the minimum viable product. We sort of mean this to indicate that there's a lot of things that we don't that we do really want in WebAssembly, like threads, like zero cost DH. We want these things. They're not in the MVP, but the most important thing for the MVP, because this is a massive new step for the web, we're introducing some massive new technology. The most important step is that we actually do release something, and we do it with all the browser vendors on board. Um, and that's actually something we've done, uh, we've been successful at so far. So we still have at this point, we have all the major browser vendors working together and cooperating to make a new standard, which is a pretty major accomplishment. And you can try it out. You can try it out. We have a demo today. Uh, I'm not going to play it for you. You can actually run this on the web if you have Firefox Nightly or Chrome Canary. Um, you, can, you can run the demo. Um, of course, the demo also has been known to run in um, versions of, of um, Microsoft Edge as well. So it's definitely a, a thing that's happening. Um, I also do want to mention one other thing on the status. That the design of WebAssembly has, has uh, sort of been fluctuating a lot over the, over the last several months. Um, it's actually been pretty much finalized at this point. So the design is basically done. Um, and we're moving on to a more of an implementation focus phase of just like finish the implementation in the browsers, um, do some more optimization, get it to go faster. I'm actually going to look at some of the optimizations coming up in here this part, in this talk a well. So looking at C++, um, the, the, one of the big things we focused on for using C++ in the MVP timeframe of WebAssembly is mscripten. mscripten is a, a C++ compiler that has a lot of great functionality that we use with SMJS. And what we're doing really now is, is focusing on keeping that level of functionality, not trying to do anything massively new, but just keeping that level of functionality and moving forward with the benefits that WebAssembly provides. So Emscripten has lots of, good, uh, lots of good stuff in it. Um, it uses Clang and LVM under the hood to actually do the, the C++ front-end work and optimization work. Um, there's a custom JS uh, backend, which is now also augmented to be able to produce WebAssembly. Um, there are C++, C and C++ standard libraries. There are libraries that provide standard C++ OpenGL bindings. Um, OpenGL is actually sort of transparently remapped onto WebGL inside the browser, which roughly corresponds to about GLES2, if you're familiar with different uh, ES levels. Um, WebGL2 is coming to browsers uh, relatively soon, which will essentially bring up to uh, GLES3 uh, APIs. And Scripton's OpenGL actually supports more than just the, the GLES2 subset. Um, but essentially, if you target that subset, you'll run fast in the browser because that's what the browser is supporting with WebGL. Um, and soon WebGL3, or WebGL2 brings GLES3. Um, SDL, providing a relatively standard interface for doing things like input, sound, um, and other kinds of uh, common tasks. Um, and Scripten also has a really broad, broad set of options for talking to JavaScript and integrating C++ code with JavaScript code. So you can have direct calls. You can literally call directly from JavaScript into WebAssembly. Um, if you don't need to do anything complicated, if you're just passing around numbers or whatever, then it's not too complicated. But if you want to do anything more, um, you typically want to use one of the other options, if you want, especially if you want to pass objects around. 
EMASM is a way to literally just put JavaScript right in the middle of C++ code. It's actually a C++ macro you can literally put in the right middle of the code as a string, and the string is JavaScript code that gets executed to that point in the code. So that makes it sort of really obvious when you're writing C++ code. If you want to stick in some JavaScript interop, you just stick it right in the middle of your code. Um, so EM is, so the question is, why is it called EMSM? EM is sort of short for inscripten, and the, the analog, the idea being presented here is that it's like inline assembly, kind of. Uh, like JavaScript, because this, this interface was developed for ASM.js, in which ASM.js is kind of serving as the assembly language of the browser. Uh, so it's sort of in, emulating an inline ASM construct. Um, with WebAssembly, I actually think going forward, uh, we're going to be able to do sort of more actually inline ASM kinds of things. Um, but in terms of interrupt with JavaScript, this is actually a very useful mechanism. And it also works in WebAssembly, even though WebAssembly isn't JavaScript. What this actually does is it puts JavaScript code off the side and then sets up the glue to arrange for a call at this point in the WebAssembly code to call out the JavaScript code among the code. So the programmer's model is just that you think, okay, I'm just writing some JavaScript code right in the middle of my C++ code and it works. And underneath the covers, there's a lot of magic being done to sort of like take that JavaScript code, move it somewhere else, and run it when it needs to be run. So mbind is uh, a rather more uh, fully featured way of talking to JavaScript from C++ code. Uh, and bind lets you pass objects around, and you can even use uh, smart pointers to manage the objects, which is really nice. And WebIDL is a, an, an interface description language that you use for a lot of different web standards and APIs. Um, it doesn't have the same uh, sort of broad swath of, of functionality as mbind does, but WebIDL can be useful in some situations. Um, and there's actually a lot more. Um, and and uh, the big picture of here, if you go to mscript.org, we have a really great website that has documentation on all these different options for how to use them, um, elaborate documentation. I'm not going to go into detail of these, unfortunately, today. But you can find all about it on Inscript.org. You can also find out about Inscript.org's file system emulation layer, which is really uh, an interesting thing. And it, it's almost largely a compatibility feature in the browser, because um, the, the way it works is you can actually bundle up files into an image and then bundle them up with your application and ship them along with your application. And your application can then open them using sort of standard C and C++ APIs to do file AO on them. Um, the reason why I sort of um, say that sort of compatibility thing is that in a lot of situations, um, forcing all of your files to be downloaded up front with the application decreases your initial startup time. So in many applications, it's actually worthwhile to optimize um, to use streaming I.O. to stream I.O., stream extra files and data files in on demand rather than having everything be downloaded up front. Um, but the file system layer is actually useful in many cases just to have uh, a sort of standard interface you can port code with. There are several different kinds of applications you can make with Inscripten. It's not just sort of uh, the, the single sort of full screen game, although you can do that. This is the Angry Bots game. Of course, you've seen the demo if you've, if you've played the demo online. Um, definitely goes into full screen mode. You push escape to go mode of full screen mode, and you're back in the browser. Um, so it's definitely one sort of the one monolithic application, statically linked, one big WASM image, full screen, sort of one large way of using uh, WebAssembly. Another large way of using WebAssembly is to use it as a hybrid application along with JavaScript. This is an application called Autodesk Format. And um, the way it works is that the, the 3D scene you're getting seen here is actually rendered with ASM.js. And the UI is actually being drawn with JavaScript and, and, and DOM calls. So it's sort of this hybrid where you're actually using both um, WebAssembly to do the sort of computational part that's rendering the scene, and then JavaScript to actually talk to the browser and draw the UI. Another way of using WebAssembly is to use it as a library. And this is actually something that's got a lot of people really excited. It's almost like you're extending the browser capabilities. You're adding new APIs to the browser that you can call from JavaScript. So if you want to write sort of a pure JavaScript application, but you want an extra little library to do some extra fun stuff, you can just sort of bundle in a little bit of WebAssembly as a library. This is a library that I'm showing off called Box2D, which just does a, a physics simulation. Um, and it's already sort of a, a well, widely used uh, library for doing stuff like this. And you can sort of bundle it up. And you can have the rest of your application written in JavaScript, or you can write it in, in C++ or other languages. But you can just like have this as a library, sort of a third kind of application. Looking forward, um, so we have Inscripten today, which we're focusing on is sort of the, the minimal disruption. There's a lot of people using ASM.js uh, with Inscripten today. Um, and it has all this great functionality. But we get a lot of feedback from, from power users and from other kind of people that want more flexibility. Inscripten kind of has a big bundle, bundle functionality that's all bundled up together. And what people are telling us, they want us to sort of refactor Inscript in it and split out the parts into like, the more useful parts. Um, so you can pick and choose the parts you want and not have to have sort of the whole package all at once. So this is definitely one of the big things we'll be focusing on going forward. Um, I also want to mention the LVM WebAssembly backend that we're working on. It's being worked on upstream, so it's part of LLVM. It's being developed upstream since the very, very beginning. 
Um, at this point, it's at the point where it can generate code for WebAssembly. It can do a pretty good job there. But there's a lot of sort of surrounding work that needs to be done to actually make a full feature tool chain. There's like Clang driver work that we need to do to sort of make Clang just a fully usable standalone thing. Um, there's there's an interesting question about like who, should we have linker? Should we have a, like a .o file format? Right now with script in your .o file format is actually LVM bitcode. Um, and it's sort of an interesting question of whether or not WebAssembly wants to support a separate compilation model with its own .o files and what that should look like. So there's definitely lots of work to be done there, and we have a lot of uh, ideas. The feedback we get from a lot of people is that I just want a regular C++ compiler, and that's what we want to deliver to. So now I want to take a tour through WebAssembly. I want to show you uh, some of the insides, and we'll get into sort of uh, the end-to-end -end version from C++ all the way down to native code and see what things look like and what actually has to happen to make this whole system work. So here's my C++ code. Um, if, you've, if you've written your own std vector before, and who hasn't, uh, this, you, this is probably pretty familiar. Basically, if, if we don't have an capacity, we have to realloc. Otherwise, we're going to just go ahead and append the element. Uh, so you compile it to WebAssembly, and you get something that looks like this in a hex dump. And I'm not really one for reading hex dumps for a while. Although the couple things I want to point out here um, in particular. So the very first byte, if you look up here, uh, is a null byte. That's interesting because the null byte is not a valid text character. It's not, in particular, it's not a valid JavaScript source file character. So in, in some contexts in a browser and some other contexts, if you want to know, am I dealing with, with JavaScript or WebAssembly? Uh, in particular on the web, this is important. Uh, you can read the very first byte and it'll tell you if it's null, it's not JavaScript. The next three bytes are ASM, which is just sort of an arbitrarily chosen magic cookie that says this is a WebAssembly file. And the next four bytes are a little endian encoded version number. Now, we're actually not hoping to use this version number ever. The, the idea with WebAssembly is to be part of the web and to grow like the web does. So instead of having a monotonic sort of set of versions that can go forward, uh, features are going to be added um, incrementally as, they, as they're developed. And the browsers might not, might, all, might not all implement the same features at the same time. So people are going to be feature testing. We don't want to have to say, OK, if WebAssembly version is greater than 3, then do this. It's going to be, if I have this feature, then do this. Uh, that's, that's really the, the way that the, the web works, the way WebAssembly is looking to work. But we have a version number just in case, in case it ever becomes necessary to make a fundamentally breaking change to the binary format uh, or to the semantics or something else, we can we can bump the version number. It's sort of this, this emergency mechanism we built in. And that's really it for the, the WebAssembly header format. Um, the rest of the binary format just consists of headers, uh, of sections. And sections just begin with an identifier, what kind of section they are, a length, how long the section is, and then the context of the section. It's literally just a concatenation of those things. So taking a look at uh, WebAssembly text, I know this is really small, you probably can't read it, but we'll zoom in on some parts here. Um, I encourage people not to think too much about the particular syntax of what's going on here, because there's a lot of different ways to present binary formats in text, and this is just one way um, that we're using right now for a variety of historical reasons. Um, so at the very top, uh, we have sort of the, the declaration section of, of declaring, um, before we get to the actual code of the, of the functions, we're sort of declaring what the, what the, what the module contains. So we have WebAssembly module. The very first thing is actually a memory declaration, and it has an operand, which is in units of pages. Pages in WebAssembly are defined to be 64 kilobytes. So we have uh, we're allocating a memory region of one 64 kilobyte region. Um, and the very next line is an export line. I'm going to get into this a little bit later in the talk about imports and exports being sort of the fundamental building blocks for putting modules together. Um, but we're actually exporting our memory, uh, our address space. I think it's really interesting to think about uh, address spaces as an object that's sort of been reified as a thing that you can import and export with a name. Yes? When you say modules, not C++ modules. That's correct. Um, in this case, module is actually closer in anal analogy to like an executable or a dynamic library. Um, it's, it's like in the elf sense, an executable file or a um, shared object, I guess is what else we call them. Uh, so that's, that's, that's yeah, that, you're right. There's, there's modules used for many different things. Um, so the WebAssembly module is actually a pretty key uh, concept that a lot of things are sort of built around. Um, and in particular, the reason why we're using the term mo module is because that's the term that, that JavaScript uses for its modules. So if you're familiar with ES6 modules, um, this module concept is fully compatible with that. They both have this imports exports concept. In fact, WebAssembly modules can import JavaScript exports and vice versa. So we're, we're tying into that whole module system that's coming to the browsers. Um, the next lines are, are dealing with imports of functions. If you remember my C++ code, I have a realloc call and there's actually a abort call. Um, I didn't define those in the module, 
This is actually somewhat unusual for WebAssembly in the field today because uh, in a typical script and compiled application, you'll have a, a statically compiled application. So things like realloc and abort would just be linked into your application rather than being imports. And, and we'll actually see in an upcoming slide what that actually looks like is, is imports um, has effect on what the, the generated code looks like. So the next line is, is exporting my function. We have a, a, a Tanium name mangling uh, for my, my pushback function and then the definition of the function. Um, so one of the other things I want to point out on this slide is that uh, all functions have signatures. Even imported functions and defined functions, there's always a signature there. So realloc, of course, has a pointer and a size t. Um, this is a ILP32 ABI, so those just both turn into I32. So realloc has two I32 arguments and an I32 result value. And I push back as a, a pointer and an int argument that was supposed to turn to I32 as well. So taking a little bit look at the actual code, WebAssembly is a stack machine. And the stack machine works really well for co encoding size. Um, if you look, think about a typical register machine, every instruction has to sort of name where the inputs are coming from and name where the output is going. And the stack machine, most operations can sort of just implicitly say, I'm, I'm taking my input, just popping them off the stack, and my result goes, gets pushed on the stack. And as a result, there's no need in the binary encoding to name the inputs and the outputs, uh, at least in the common case. Um, and then we have uh, what we call locals or local variables as sort of the general purpose non-SSA registers that can be used for like everything else. Things that need to be used multiple times, things that can't be used in the life of ordering that the stack requires. So you can see, if you remember my code, this is actually the code for doing the v.length equals v.capacity. So first we're doing the get local, that's the v. Then we're doing the load, that's loading the, the length field. And you can see we have an offset, this sort of built-in built in constant offset mechanism. Um, so we're loading the push get. Uh, so take the value of local variable zero, dollar zero, push from the stack. Then the load up brand, load instruction pops it off the stack and pushes the loaded value on the stack. Um, T local is actually kind of an interesting thing. Um, so set local would be the normal thing to, to set to a local variable. Um, what, would, what set local would do is pop a value off the stack and assign to a local. What T does is leave it on the stack and assign it to a local. And it's called T because if you think of like the Unix T, the value is going to two places. It's staying on a stack and going to a local. So this is essentially a way of of having a value that has multiple uses. The first use will still be on the stack. We can still pop it on the stack later on, but it's also available as a local variable for us to use. Um, don't worry too much of all those crazy details. This is the kind of stuff that compilers will take care of you, for, take care for you. All this stuff is done um, within the code generator. I'm just sort of walking through it so you can get an idea of what's going on in WebAssembly. Um, the next line is another get local, another load. This is loading capacity. I think about any is the non-equal operator. Um, of course, notice how i32.any has no operands. It just implicitly pops two things up the stack, pushes the result on the stack, zero or one, and then BRA has a conditional branch. So another interesting property of WebAssembly that sort of makes it different from other, WebAssembly lang other assembly languages is that it has structured control flow. Um, this actually gets really interesting, but again, it's one of these things that as a C++ programmer, you don't have to worry about exactly what's going on here. The compiler will take care of it for you. And, and set everything up. Um, this is block structure, which is a hierarchical structure that goes on. Um, and the rules are kind of complicated, but I don't really want to get into it right now. I just want to mention that there is uh, structure control flow. <coughs> so the next step is we take the WebAssembly code, we send it to a browser, and the very first thing the browser wants to do is compile it to native code. Um, what I'm showing here is actually the x64 code that we're generating. This is from uh, Firefox Nightly, or, or pretty close. I actually cleaned up, cleaned up some things just for a presentation here. But this is pretty close to what Firefox is generating on the left, um, or on, on the right, I'm sorry. And on the left, I actually wanted just uh, a comparison of this is what LVM is generating for x64 when compiling that same C++ code just for a native platform. So you get an idea of, of sort of the ballpark we're in. Obviously, the WebAssembly code is a bit longer at this point, um, and I want to sort of dive in and, and explain exactly what those reasons are. Um, a particular interest that I have in, uh, in this kind of system is what are the things that are there because of WebAssembly, the language, what are the things that are there because of the implementation? Uh, Firefox is actually using IonMonkey, which is its JS JIT to do the code gen, which is not the same code gen as LVM's code gen. So we'll see some of the answers are because of WebAssembly, and some of the answers are because Firefox doesn't have the optimizations yet. So the very first thing I want to point out is the very, uh, one of the first things the function does is a recursion check. WebAssembly requires that when, when you run out of stack space on your call stack, that the program trap reliably. There's no sort of undefined, undefined behavior when running out the end of the stack. We have to have to check. Um, there are fancier ways in VMs to check for running out of stack space. This is a very, very simple way of just like load a known value, compare it with the stack pointer, and, and do a conditional branch. Yes, question? Uh, and the 
you mentioned it was a little bit code, but why is it supported? So that's a good question. So the question is, I mentioned it was 32-bit code, but we're actually looking at 64-bit registers. So what this is, is the WebAssembly code is 32-bit, but it's running on a 64-bit machine. So the, the, uh, the application's model of pointers are 32-bit within the sandbox, and then it's being compiled to run on a 64-bit machine with 64-bit pointers. So I mentioned before that realloc was actually a call import, or a, a call to an imported function. Um, in a typical native situation with a dynamic library, um, this would sort of be equivalent to uh, one dynamic library calling into another one, where you might use like a PLT mechanism. Um, Firefox doesn't have PLTs in its code generator right now, so we're just doing a very simple thing of like load the address from a table and do an indirect call, which isn't very nice, and PLTs are nicer. Uh, but this is, like, this is in the category of things that is not fundamental to WebAssembly, it's just something that Firefox could do better. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to improve. Um, and another one in that category, so that is that v dot capacity times two, we're doubling the length. Um, this gets optimized into a shift by one. Of course, if you really want to go fast on x6, you have to optimize this into an LEA, which is even fastier. Uh, so one, one other thing to quickly look at before we get done geeking out about x86 code. Uh, this is actually the code for doing the v dot length equals v dot capacity test, and you can see the code is actually really, really simple. Just literally just doing a load with offset uh, four, load with offset eight, and do a comparison and go. So it's, it's very literal in terms of, of what the WebAssembly code looks like. Um, but there's a couple of interesting things going on here. One of them is that we have register plus register addressing going on here. The original code literally just had one base and a constant offset. It was the V base and then the length is an offset. Um, but because WebAssembly code is sandbox, it's actually running inside of its own address space embedded in the process address space. Uh, RDI here is actually the application pointer. It's a 32-bit value. Of course, we've used the 64-bit encoding of it, so that's why it shows up as our RDI here instead of EDI. But it's actually a 32-bit unsigned value. And R15 here is the base register of the address space. So this is essentially um, every, every load in the store in this implementation will have R15 as the very first ad, uh, register. And then the next register will be the user ladder, address, uh, user's pointer. And then, of course, you can have a constant offset. Um, this is an area where like, WebAssembly fundamentally does impose a restriction on the implementation. We do have to have this sandboxing property because that's like a fundamental security requirement that we have the sandboxing. However, there's, there's yet hope if we still want to have optimized address modes, if we don't want to have to burn two registers uh, or burn an extra register on every address mode to pay for the sandboxing thing. One thing that would be possible to do here is if we look at the addresses, it's R15 plus RDI happens twice. Um, in a large application, you actually could have many loads and stores that are basically repeating the same uh, base of the address space plus the same pointer plus a different offset. It would be possible to factor that plus out and do like an LEA and, and save base of the address space plus some value once. And then from that point on, you just have a single register that you can address with. So a clever VM could actually do things in that way. And then you'd actually free up another register space in your address mode. So this is another opportunity for, for clever VMs to optimize even further. Um, but I think the meta point here is that the, the generated assembly code is actually pretty simple. And I guess one other thing I can, I can sort of say here is that uh, this being x86, you could fold one of the loads into the compare because you can do that on x86 and save a register. So there's, there's a bunch of things that we can do uh, in the implementation that are not fundamental to WebAssembly to make the code better. Um, and there are actually very few things that WebAssembly is imposing on us making the code worse. Yes, but question. I think it's actually really good because the CPU can do both of them at the same time uh, out of order. So it's actually pretty good. Um, so in general, uh, yeah, when you... There's no like data dependencies, so it should like load EAC and AAX mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, and only the compare is like the blocking thing. Yeah, so folding the load into the compare isn't going to make it go significantly faster. It will make, there's one less instruction, and it, the main thing it'll do is it'll free up a register. The, the disadvantage of this approach is that we actually do have to write to a register and only read it once. Yeah, but this register um, renaming, so it's not but there's register pressure. In a larger example, having this register free would be a, a win. Uh, this is a small example, it, it doesn't really matter here, but yeah, in, in general, it is good to do the folding because you save registers and, and save register pressure. So, um, and, and in terms of the, the microarchitecture, the, fold, the load is gonna get unfolded by the hardware anyway, so. Um, that's a good question, thanks. So we built a fun little tool. You can actually go to this URL. Um, if you can take a picture or something. Uh, what we have here in this tool is basically a, an interface where you can type in C++ code and it will show you the x86 code that we're generating for it. Um, this is using uh, the Firefox engine. 
Um, and it actually has, also has a mode where it can actually see all of the native code. You can sort of do a direct apply by side comparison. So this is kind of putting us on the spot. As you see, we have some things we need to do to catch up to LVM. Um, or maybe someday we'll know we'll, we'll use LVM itself in the browser. That's sort of an open question. Um, but for now, you can go here. You can see it. You can do direct side by side comparisons. And you can even file bugs directly from that, that web page. So uh, the next big thing I want to talk about in, in WebAssembly to sort of explain how it works is to deep, dig a little bit deeper into modules and, and what we mean by web modules and WebAssembly. Um, I think I mentioned before, modules are sort of the analog of a, like an executable or a shared library. So it's a linked thing that has, it, it's more than just a .o file. It's actually sort of a fully formed thing that can be loaded into the runtime and executed. Um, it has multiple functions in it. And, and you can have imports and exports, so sort of the two main verbs that we have at this point. Um, and we have a two-level namespace that's similar to the Mako um, two-level namespace, where you don't just import a, a flat name. You actually import uh, a name of a library and then a name of the thing in the library that you're importing from, um, which can significantly uh, speed up dynamic resolution of symbols. A set of things that can be imported and exported, sort of the, this, the ontology, if you will, is memories, tables, globals, and functions. And I'll sort of walk through what those all are and what it means to import and export them. And, and I want to mention that these are the the building blocks for dynamic libraries. WebAssembly doesn't actually have a concept of the dynamic libraries built in. You just have a concept of two modules, and if modules share enough pieces, then they're basically dynamic libraries. Uh, Modulo some policy that they have to add. So my example showed an export of, of memory. Um, what that really means is that within a module, you can export your, your address space, and other, other modules can access it. So if your JavaScript code can come in and poke at the bytes of memory, or you can share essentially two modules sharing a memory, which is basically one of the big building blocks of dynamic libraries is two things living in the same address space. So I show a little diagram here of, of a, basically a linear memory is essentially just an array of bytes. Starts at zero, goes up to some size we call current memory. Um, memory can be declared with a maximum size, which actually gives VMs some lot of flexibility to pre-allocate address space, even if they don't pre-allocate the memory um, to allow it to resize effectively. Um, and web and memory can be grown. You can do loads and stores. I'm showing a value x, which is just some index, and you can do a load and store from x. You can load i32, i64, f32, f64, and there are specialized instructions for doing 8-bit and 16-bit loads and stores. Um, of course, one of the fun things about uh, reifying address spaces into a conceptual object is that you can think about having multiple address spaces. This isn't the common case for C++, because the C++ language itself just has a single address space for data. Um, but you can imagine either a smart compiler or language extensions of various kinds that can have at multiple address spaces. And um, if you don't need a pointer that needs to be able to point into both address spaces, you can uh, segregate them. And the advantage of doing that is you can get some better isolation. So WebAssembly sandboxing protects the application, uh, protects the, the browser and the user from the application, but doesn't protect the, protect the application from itself. And splitting application into multiple address spaces is one way you can have an application protect itself from itself. The next major concept of, of WebAssembly that can be imported and exported from module is the table. The table is a very, very general purpose concept of WebAssembly that's going to eventually be used for a lot of different things. Um, right now, it's just being used for indirect function calls. So what a table is, is just an array. Uh, an array where the elements are opaque to the application. So the main use case here that we have right now is that the array holds functions. And so we have this sort of index space starting at zero uh, with functions. And the way the call indirect instruction works to make an indirect call is the operand to it is just an index into this table. So in this case, if x is 2, then you call the function quox, and that's how call indirect works. Um, this is effectively because it's a separate index space from the linear address space from memory. Um, this is effect effectively uh, sort of a two address space situation, which makes it a Harvard architecture, which is somewhat interesting. Um, of course, um, the next thing that could be imported and exported from WebAssembly are globals, which are literally global variables, just like global variables in C++, except that they don't have, they don't live in the address space. They can't have their address taken. So in theory, uh, a smart compiler could actually compile a C++ global variable into a WASM global variable if it wanted to, if it, if it could prove the address is not taken. Um, there's not really a lot of reason to do it, um, unless that global is going to be imported and exported, because the nice thing about these is that it could be imported and exported with a very, much tighter granularity than the entire address space. With, with linear memory, you have to import and export the entire address space. And if you can say, I'm going to have certain values that I want to communicate between modules, I just want to put them in a global variable rather than have my entire address space be passed around. 
And the final thing you can import in Xmode and WebAssembly are functions. We've covered functions a little bit before, but functions basically just contain a signature, which has argument types and return types, and a body, which has local variables in it and code, and code is just the sequence of instructions. So those four things. Um, the big picture here is that WebAssembly doesn't have any kind of like syscall instructions or IO instructions. It's literally the only way of talking to the outside world is to interact with imports and, and exports. Those are sort of the only communication mechanisms. So moving forward, as we talk, start talking about um, security, the only things we have to worry about in security are the things that deal with imports and exports. Yeah, so the, these, these four things uh, come together as sort of the building blocks of dynamic libraries because if you have two modules of two pieces of code and at one time they're sharing address space, they're sharing an indirect function table space, they're basically, in, 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 in native terms, you could think of it as essentially two different libraries loaded into the same process because essentially they're sharing the same address space and they're sharing the same indirect function space. So the, the idea here is the separation of, of policy and mechanism, where the mechanism is just this very general concept of being able to import and export modules. And, and the policy, um, you, could, you can implement a wide variety of policies on top of this. So there's a lot of different ways to do dynamic libraries in C++, and you can have different ways of handling weak symbols and different ways of doing interesting symbol resolution. All that stuff is gonna be essentially be a policy layer that's not gonna be baked into the system at all. There will likely be very standard ways of, of doing this. This is going to be standard tools you use for like dynamic libraries, but it's not going to be baked in. Um, and we expect that's going to give us a lot of flexibility for implementing um, interesting new languages um, and, and new language features. So with that, with imports and exports being the things we have to worry about for security, let's take a look at security and how WebAssembly actually um, is, is made secure. So the first thing we talked about in imports and exports is linear memory. And the, thing, the main thing you can do with linear memory are loads and stores. So how are we gonna make those secure? The very easiest, simplest way to do it is just to stick a bounds check on every single load and store. If the index is in bounds, is less than the current memory, then it's in bounds. Otherwise, it's out of bounds and you go to the error handler. That's sort of the very simplest way of doing it. Um, but a common trick that's being used um, in, in 64-bit uh, engines is if you're running a WASM 32-bit uh, thing in a 64-bit engine, and this is the code that we saw earlier, this is what was happening, this is why you didn't see bounce checks. Um, we can actually reserve address space up to, um, well, we'll start with four gigabytes and ignore the offset for now. We can reserve up to four gigabytes of address space, and then we don't need to have any bounce checking because if you're in bounds, the load store will just succeed. If you're out of bounds, the load store will, will hit part of the address space that we've managed to make so it's not readable or not writable, so it'll seg fault and the VM can catch the site fault and, and, and jump to the error handle at that point. So this is essentially a technique so that in a common case, when you're running a 64-bit browser, running a 32-bit WebAssembly application, there's no bounce checking overhead. Of course, uh, loads of stores can have uh, offsets. Um, so you can imagine extending beyond the four gigabyte range to eight gigabytes because it's actually a 32-bit offset at most. Um, and if you want to do things like fold in uh, scaled offsets, you can actually extend the address space even further. So it's uh, the idea is in a 64 bit process that address space is not a, a precious resource. You have lots of address space. And you're not actually allocating memory for it. It's just sort of this, uh, one of the terminology you use is it's reserved but not committed address space. So it's just, it's out there, nothing else can use it, and it's, it's mapped so that if you touch it, you'll get a seg fault. It's not actually contributing to memory being used. Of course, 32 bit browsers are also important, 32 bit engines are also important. Um, so we've been looking at a variety of, of hybrid techniques where we can actually just uh, have a single guard page at the end of the address space. And this allows us to do things like if you have uh, two offsets that are from the same base plus different offsets, or two loads are from the same dates with different offsets, um, if you can prove that one of them is in bounds and the other one is within the size of a guard page, then you don't need to do bounds checking for the second one. And using techniques like this, we've actually found that you can, you can easily eliminate over half of the bounds checks, even just using a simple bounds checking technique. So we can actually significantly reduce this. Um, and we actually haven't even started applying uh, sort of the fancier bounce checking techniques, things like ABCD and those other like loop aware kinds of optimizations. So I think there's actually a lot more room even, even beyond 50% for eliminating bounce checks in, in 32 bit browsers. Uh, of course, we're always on the lookout for, for hardware techniques to do sandboxing more efficiently. Intel has added a number of features to their chips recently, which are pretty intriguing. Um, although it, it seems that right now the, the ones that are coming available don't actually quite support the model that, that WebAssembly needs for doing sandboxing, but we're definitely um, keeping our eye out there for new opportunities. Um, the next big thing in WebAssembly that we need to sandbox the, of the import and export list is, is the tables and the indirect function calls. 
Um, so again, so the same story here, the basic thing you can do is you can do a bounce check on the table. So you do a call indirect, the operand to call indirect is an index, and the index is gonna be in the next table. If you're beyond the end of the table, then you're out of bounds, and the call doesn't work. Uh, WebAssembly also has to do a signature check. It requires that the types of the call, caller match the types of the callee. And that can actually be done with a single, you can, you can essentially encode a call signature as a single integer. So you can do that with a single integer comparison. Um, this means that there's somewhat of basic uh, control flow integrity built in, um, but it's not full control flow integrity. It's just sort of a minimal control flow integrity at the level of the WASM type system. Um, this is sort of a, an area that's still being developed, and this idea of, of tables, and, and when we have multiple memories, you can also think of having multiple tables, and if you can split up your function space into multiple spaces, you can get finer granularity on function checking. So there's a lot of different ideas about the way you can use this. Uh, for example, C++ V tables are typically compiled such that you have a struct in your address space. It's just, it's just data. Um, and that, but that's actually not necessary because applications can't point at their own V tables. There's no way to actually get at it from, a, from C++ code. So we could actually put C++ V tables outside the address space in a table and use that to reduce some of the overhead of, of making a C++ V table call. Um, another idea with tables is if you uh, segregate your, your indirect function table space such that each table only has functions of a single type, then you know from that uh, calling any function in that table will have the correct type, so you don't actually need to do a type check in that case. So these are some ideas that people are, are throwing around of how we can reduce the overhead of, of indirect function calls. Um, the other parts of WebAssembly, the imports and exports that we need to worry about securing, uh, global variables and functions, don't actually have much for security. There's really nothing you can do with a global variable that can actually cause a security problem. Um, and for functions, really the only thing you need to know is that uh, with, with a call direct with the table mechanism, you can only call to the top of a function. You can't actually call into the middle of a function. You can't call into random data. Data is not actually executable. Like, all you can call are the top of a function. So we have a very strong uh, control flow guarantee in that sense. Um, and of course, call stack overflow is checked so that there's no way you can run over the stack and, and get out of the sandbox. So I mentioned that, that CFI um, using multiple tables, people are actually looking at doing a stronger CFI where you can actually split up the function space into um, tables that represent the C++ type system more precisely so you can do full C++ aware type uh, CFI. That comes with some extra overhead, but it is, it is possible. So this is the category of, of things you can do to help applications secure themselves against themselves rather than just securing it against the browser, because the browser is, is kept secure by the basic guarantees of the sandboxing. Uh, one of my top my favorite topics to talk about, undefined behavior. Um, C++ is still C++. It still has this undefined behavior in, in all the same ways that it does. When you're compiling with Mscripten or any other C++ compiler, you run the optimizer, it's gonna take advantage of undefined behavior in the same way that it always does, even when it's targeting WebAssembly. Um, that said, when you get WebAssembly out the other end, it basically has all the, all the undefined behavior resolved out, as it were. It's, it's much like when you get x86 code from a compiler. The compiler that optimized the code took advantage of undefined behavior, but once you get x86 code, that code is gonna behave the same way, modulo, threading, and, and other various things that are sort of acceptance to this. But for the most part, that code you get is gonna behave the same way all the time on all, on all x86 implementations. And we're really going for the same thing with WebAssembly, is that if I see plus code, if you have undefined behavior, you have a bug, and if you recompile your code with different flags, different compiler, different version of the compiler, it could do a lot of different things. But once you get some WebAssembly output, if that code works in one browser, it'll work in another browser. There's no possibility that um, your, your undefined behavior is gonna still get exploited. Uh, modulo, a couple of areas where there's a there's very limited amount of non-determinism, um, but it's very, very small. There's no such thing as, as nasal, nasal demons in WebAssembly. Optimization is, is a really important topic when you're running in a, in a very resource-constrained environment, like a browser in many cases. Um, sort of standard optimization applies. Um, the O2-03 sort of mean different things, as they always do, and no one really actually knows what the difference between O2 and O3 is. But you can try both of them and see which one works for you. Um, OS can optimize for size as well. Um, I mentioned also earlier that, that floating point is fully deterministic, so IEEE 754 floating point um, specifies what happens. But that does mean that uh, VMs can't do things for you, like optimize your floating point in various ways that would change the answer. So we can't change division to multiply reciprocal, we can't do reassociation, we can't distribute multiplies over adds, that kind of thing. Um, but it doesn't mean that those optimizations are off limits for WebAssembly, because those optimizations can be done in the compiler producing WebAssembly. So the idea is, you think of WebAssembly as an ISA. ISAs don't have fast math flags, but compilers do. So you pass these to your compiler, like in Scripten, 
um, and it will take advantage of these and do these optimizations for you ahead of time. That way, if the value is changed, it's changed everywhere. There's no such problem as of different uh, browsers giving you different floating point answers. Uh, the dash s no exit runtime equals one flag is an script and optimization, which is uh, kind of a fun optimization. If you think of uh, a typical web app, doesn't ever actually exit. You have a page open, interact with the page, and then you close the tab, or you press back, or you do something like that. The application goes away. There's no actual time where you just say, okay, I'm going to actually exit. I want to call my global destructors. Um, so dash ex no exit runtime actually tells subscript and just omit the code for all the global destructors and the, the exit code, um, and saving some code size. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier, the streaming assets on demand is actually really important, especially for a lot of games that have very large uh, graphics assets that they have to download. If you require users to download the entire assets for your entire game up front, it's a very, very large download and it takes away one of the big things of the web. Um, so streaming things on demand is, is really useful. Um, use URLs is actually a really, really important thing. It's, I, I mentioned it's an optimization, but really it's, it's more of a meta-optimization as far as how you use the web and how you think about the web. So with, with the URL, the beauty of the web is the user clicks on something and they can just be launched right into the game. Um, hopefully Wi-Fi in here is, is fast enough to make this an impressive demo. Um, we're still downloading. Okay, well, there we go. So I clicked on a link and suddenly I'm in the game. And I'm not actually very good at first-person shooters. This is actually kind of an old demo. Um, it's a fun demo though, it's multiplayer and there's a bot in here somewhere that's gonna come after me. Um, but the point is, um, this is actually a really interesting model for attracting users and getting people engaged in the application. There's no need to have them install an app, press something out, it looks like I didn't do very well. Uh, <laughs> um, but you just like, you have a URL, post it to Twitter, post it to whatever you want, people click on it and they can play in the game. It's especially interesting for multiplayer games because you have people clicking on a link and can be joining uh, a multiplayer game altogether at once. It can be, happen very quickly because it's such a low friction overhead. So it's definitely something you want to sort of think about in terms of uh, deploying applications and, and organizing them. So WebAssembly, I mentioned the design is basically done at this point for the MVP, which is a very limited release, but we have all the browser vendors participating. And there's lots more to come. There's lots of stuff we want to add to WebAssembly going forward. Once we get our, our, our base set up, we can build on, we're going to be adding lots of cool features. Dynamic libraries are going to significantly improve uh, download times and, and all applications to be split up and be update, updated more in a more fine grained way. Um, that comes with the requirement to have a stable ABI, C and C++ ABI, so we can have dynamic li libraries that don't have version skew. Um, of course, threads with shared memory are going to be a very, very critical feature for performance. Um, SIMD. Um, debugging features, live M optimizations. There's just tons of stuff that we want to do to make WebAssembly awesome, C++ platform. All right, with that, I can open up for questions. So, WebAssembly.github.io. <laughs> yes, question. So, uh, when you go to some public URL and there's WebAssembly stuff that happens, mm -hmm. Like you just showed. Yep. Would you have other URLs kind of displayed that people could click on that would go into different parts of the same kind of compiled application, or would it would it go to a different, like make a different server request and get a different WASM? If that makes sense. Uh, I think it does. Um, I think the answer is you could do it both ways. Did you ask a question for the recording? Yeah, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I think so. The answer is. Um, like most of the demos that we're showing are sort of full screen applications where you click on something and you just, there's a single target that you go to. Like you play the game and it's just like, the entry point of the game is always the same no matter how you arrive there. Right. Um, but it's definitely possible to have, like you can pass arguments into a WebAssembly program or you could have multiple WebAssembly images. Um, there's, there's a different lot of ways you can organize it. Um, you can have multiple WebAssembly elements on a single page even. So it's, it's you can direct people to different parts of the page. You can, um, I, mean, I think there's just lots of different ways you can organize your application to have different people having different experiences. Yes, question over here. Or, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, when there's a sec fault, what happens? And secondly, is there webassembly.h, like the script? Yeah, so the first question, when there's a seg fault, what happens? Um, so a seg fault in native code happens when you, for example, dereference a null pointer, uh, for example, yeah, or... I mean, like, what happens inside the VM, like, untangled, uh, what's it? 
Oh, so like so in, in this this uh, the memory mapped trick for avoiding bounce checking, for example, you reach beyond the address space, you touch a page that's not mapped, yeah, so seg faults. Yeah. Uh, what does the user see? Yeah, so the, so um, the user sees uh, in, in terms of WebAssembly, the WebAssembly VM it uh, executes what we call a trap, and trap means that the current thread is terminated, and if it was called from JavaScript, JavaScript will see a JavaScript exception being thrown. Um, and, and for WebAssembly right now, today, that's the most common use case is you're getting calls from JavaScript. So you'll get, a, you'll get an exception coming out of the VM. Um, and, and your other question was, is there a WebAssembly.h? Um, right now, there is no such thing. But we still have, uh, when you're using Emscripten, which is the primary thing to do right now in the MVT time frame, you're getting uh, all the Emscripten features are there. So you have Emscripten.h there as well. Okay. Um, what's the code size difference between Emscripten uh, and WebAssembly? Well, so Inscripten is the compiler that can produce either ASM.js or WebAssembly. That's, I guess, probably what you're asking is the ASM.js versus WebAssembly code side difference. Um, I don't have the numbers with me right now, but it's uh, significantly smaller. Um, WebAssembly is a binary format that's not, I mean, I... Half size. Uh, saying about half size? Um, my experience is that it's, it's more than half, but, or it's, it's smaller than half, but um, I unfortunately I don't have a number right off the top of my head that I, I want to be confident in telling you, but it's, it's quite a lot smaller. Um, Yes, question. So WebAssembly speed is about the same as ASM.js speed today. Uh, in, in Firefox, we're using our same engine. It's all the same code, essentially running uh, WebAssembly as we're running with ASM.js. So the speed's about the same, which is about 1.5x slower than native um, is, is in sort of many, uh, many kind of common situations. Um, but I walked through some of the native code earlier in the talk, and I showed that we actually have a lot of examples where Firefox doesn't generate optimal code. Um, and those are things that we can do to optimize that don't require changes to the WebAssembly language. So I think over time, we're going to be getting um, significantly faster. Yes, question? Can you use the WebAssembly to interact with the DOM? And is that at all recommended? All right, so the question is, can you use WebAssembly to interact with the DOM? And the answer is, right now, today, with the current WebAssembly, you can't. Um, WebAssembly does not have GC features. And almost all the DOM APIs, you're, you're basically dealing with GC objects, not coming from the DOM. That is a feature that's planned for the future um, that will be coming up. WebAssembly will, will, is expected to gain the ability to hold onto a GC handle to, to talk to GC objects and be able to call the DOM directly. So right now, what you do is you call the JavaScript and have the JavaScript call the DOM for you. Um, it turns out that for most DOM APIs, the actual DOM work is the overhead. So the overhead of calling through JS isn't actually that significant most of the time. Um, but it is significant that it is something that we want to fix. We want to have WebAssembly be able to call directly into the DOM. All right. A question? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, they have an application which is all written in JavaScript today. They want to know if there's any advantage to taking advantage of WebAssembly. So WebAssembly does not make JavaScript code go any faster. There's no way to sort of compile JavaScript into WebAssembly today. Um, so unless you were to write new code in a different language, then the answer is no. Um, or, or potentially, if you were able to bring in libraries and use them from your JavaScript code, uh, the libraries could be compiled into WebAssembly. You could call them from JavaScript code. It would be another way you could do it. But there's not really any way to make your actual JavaScript code run into WebAssembly and run any faster. All right, yes? So with Emscript, um, it was easy to combine JavaScript and Emscript with C++. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is the way to do it now? You export some functions and then you can freely call them from JavaScript code, the functions exported from JavaScript, Yeah, so I guess the question is, with ASM.js, it's relatively easy to bridge ASM.js with JavaScript because you can call functions. Um, and, and the answer is WebAssembly can do the same thing. You can call WebAssembly uh, functions directly from JavaScript and vice versa. Uh, so if WebAssembly exports a function, um, uh, in, in, the, in the JS API, when you get a WebAssembly module object, that's a module object in, the, in JavaScript, and the module object has properties for every exported function, and those are just functions you can call from JavaScript. So that's the way to access DOM. You, you access your DOM from your JavaScript file and then just call module. That's right, yeah. So that's uh, bridging to the DOM is, is not something that most people need to worry about because some script then does it for you. But yeah, essentially there's, there's uh, a pretty simple error that's, that's doing a lot of the bridging. Yes, question? What's the status of browser support now and in the near future? So the status of browser support now, um, 
So Firefox Nightly and Chrome Canary are able to run the, the current demos that we have. Uh, Microsoft Edge has been able to run some of the demos. I don't think it can run the one that's currently live on the website, but they're definitely, um, there's an inflation in progress, and the WebKit is also inflation in progress. I don't know, we had someone who was working on it on the WebKit team here earlier, but he's not here anymore, so. Uh, but it definitely all the browsers are at least working on it, and some of the browsers have uh, sort of publicly usable demos right now in their early release browsers. Yes, question? Do the browsers have uh, hooks for tooling support to debug or profile targeting? The question is, do the browsers have support for hooks for um, debugging or profiling? And the answer is not very many right now. Um, that's actually an open area that we want definitely know that we need to improve on. Um, so, yes, definitely an area to improve in. I think it's actually one of my, my bullet points that one of my slides here is like going forward to add um, debugging support. Um, I'm actually kind of excited uh, about a particular aspect of the debugging support. If you think about like a debugger for a language like C++ is actually a fairly complex tool. It's going to do a lot of different things. It needs to have a sort of mini REPL that you can type expressions into and evaluate them, which means you essentially have to have a full fledged C++ compiler, sort of. Um, that's a lot of complexity to build into a browser. And if you think about, if we're supporting multiple languages, um, every single language would have to have its own version of the debugger. We don't want to have to build all these things into browsers. So the really the idea here is to have APIs and allow um, languages to essentially provide their own debuggers. Compilers could provide their own debuggers. So you, you take an existing good debugger, like say even GDB or LDB, some kind of debugger like that, and compile it, port it to the WebAssembly APIs using the uh, whatever uh, mechanisms are available, and then um, that would be your UI. So the browser itself wouldn't have to hard code the UI. Um, it's a possibility. What about profiling support? Um, profiling support. Um, so Firefox Nightly actually has some like minimal uh, profiling support. You can actually run this on WebAssembly code and, and get essentially a profile of, of showing you hot functions. It's not, a, it's not a very extensive profiling tool if you're familiar with sort of fancy tools like V2 and whatever, um, but it can show you some basic uh, what, what's hot kind of things. Um, also definitely an area that we know there's a lot of room for improvement. Yes? Are there any C++ features you should uh, prefer or avoid to optimize performance relative to native So are there any C++ features that you should definitely prefer or avoid uh, relative to native, native code? Um, the main feature that comes to mind right now is exception handling. So in the MVP of WebAssembly, the very first version, we don't have zero cost EH support. And essentially, exceptions are being emulated. So if you have exceptions, C++ exceptions in your code, um, that's going to be pretty inefficient right now. It's definitely something we're going to fix. In a subsequent version of WebAssembly, we're planning on having a zero cost EH mechanism built in. Um, but until we get that, exceptions are something to watch out for. If you have another question up here. Yeah, is there any plan to add support for like hooking into a dynamic library that's already on the system or could be downloaded to the system? The so question is, is there any plan to support uh, hooking into a dynamic library that's already on the system or could be downloaded from the system? Um, I'm not aware of any plans for that. Um, and it would actually be significantly difficult because WebAssembly code is running inside of a sandbox and native code is not built to run inside of a sandbox. Um, bridging that, um, in particular, if you want to pass pointers between the WebAssembly code and the native code, um, there'd have to be some kind of bridge layer and it, it's really difficult to do automatically. Yes, question? Once you've downloaded one of these WebAssembly uh, libraries, is it, does it remain in the browser cache or do you have to re-download it? So the question is, when you download one of these WebAssembly binaries, just say in the browser cache. Um, so it, it uses the same mechanisms of the regular browser um, cache for HTTP cache, that kind of stuff. Um, we actually also cache the generated native code. So when on the first download of that application, we compile it into native code. Um, that takes some time. On the second load of the application, we'll actually just do a quick hash of the, of the binary. See, if we've seen this before and we have the, the native code in the cache, we can just literally map the native code in and, and run it. So uh, it, it's a very, so the second one is a very fast experience. We're working on, on driving the first download uh, time. That's, that's like why WebAssembly has a small code size and a fast decode time is to get that very first experience down because that's really important. But subsequent loads are fast because they're cached. All right, read. Uh, yeah, so uh, caching, the code. <clears throat> caching the code, the code doesn't have uh, pointers to native objects embedded in it. How do you deal with that? Do you just... So caching like, the code you, and, and... The first example you had, uh, uh, a check to make sure that the stack didn't overflow. Yeah, so I, I showed some native code earlier that had uh, an example with native code that actually had a hard-coded virtual address in it. Um, and if we're caching the code, how would deal with that? And the, and the answer right now is that we do patching. We just keep track of that and, and patch it in, which isn't um, particularly great. Uh, I think actually our, our main strategy going forward is going to be to generate pick 
and just use everything pick and, and avoid actually embedding anything to the code so we don't need to touch any of the code when we load it in. Uh, that's not implemented all yet, but that's right now what we have. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, do we support setup and long jump? And if so, how do we get the qubits here? And the answer is, yes, we do. Um, and uh, it's somewhat, um, maybe this is another thing I should mention in sort of C++ features to avoid is setup and long jump. They do work, they're not gonna be fast. So the way they actually work, when you do a set jump uh, today, and Scripten will actually translate that into a call out to JavaScript, which will do a try block, and then on the stack, call back into WebAssembly. And then when you do a long jump, we call the JavaScript, which throws, which will unwind the stack through the WebAssembly back into the JavaScript, which has this try block still on the stack, which will catch it. So this is all staying within the VM. It's all sandbox. It's all good to go. Um, but you're dealing with multiple sort of FFI calls into JavaScript back, doing a JavaScript try block, which is never going to be amazing, and then calling back. So it's a lot of uh, just even just doing a set jump is, is a lot of overhead. So it's it's um, and actually looking forward, when, when you talk about adding the zero cost EH features, we're considering implementing set jump long jump on top of the zero cost EH features, just because it'll be so much faster. All right. Yes. Question. Does the uh, WebAssembly have support for accessing like local storage or IndexedDB or anything like that? So does WebAssembly have support for accessing local storage in XDB? Um, and the answer is the same, essentially the same thing for like accessing the DOM. So WebAssembly itself doesn't actually have access to it, but you can call the JavaScript and JavaScript cannot talk to those APIs and do that kind of stuff. Um, so Inscripten actually has support when I talk about the uh, emulating the file system and this kind of stuff. Inscripten actually has support for um, giving you APIs that are more familiar to a C++ programmer that are implemented in terms of NXDB, so you don't have to deal with NXDB yourself. Um, but uh, and, and going forward, when we add uh, like native access from WebAssembly into the DOM, we can also add native access from WebAssembly into other web APIs like NXDB and other kinds of things like that. So those will be added as well. All right, I guess. If people have other questions, you're welcome to come up after the talk. So 